How are you all doing? It's good to see you all this morning. I'm going to have to adjust my microphone and bring my shoes. Right now. <laughs> you realize they make that big of a difference. So I've been in the socks the last couple of weeks, now I'm wearing shoes, and I'm at least an inch and a half tall. Anyway, good morning. Good to see you all. Welcome to Cross Point Church. Uh, however, upon the focus this morning, I'll be reading from Hebrews chapter 4. I'll begin reading there in verse 14. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I want to focus on verse 16. It says, there, it says this, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we have may obtain mercy. And find grace and help of time again. Verse 16 said, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. And I just thought, you know, thought I'd ask, what kind of week did you have when you walked with God this week? Good week? Bad week? Did you have one of those weeks where everything's just mountaintop all the way? Yeah, victory in Jesus every day, right? Everything's rocking and rolling. Everything's perfect. Everything's great. Yes, did you have one of those weeks? We always feel, we always feel like, yeah, let's go boldly to the throne then, right? We can go boldly, man. This is it's great. But the weeks that we don't have the mountaintop experiences, the weeks where we struggle with temptation, maybe we stumble, maybe there's some things that are really trying our faith, maybe we failed within the, within the week walking with the Lord. We always, we don't feel as bold, do we? We want to do what? Instead of coming into the Father's presence, we want to kind of just, we don't think about coming boldly. We think about coming timidly if we think about coming boldly. But it says here to come boldly. It reminds me of one time as, as a boy, I was in the first grade. Back in the good old days when public educators were allowed to beat children. Uh, <laughs> you know, or I should say discipline, formal punishment, whatever you want to call it. Felt like beating. Uh, Back in those days, I remember when I went to school, my dad told me that, hey, when you go to school, if you get three swats of school, when you get home, he said, how many swats are you going to get? I said, three. He said, that's right. He said, so you just remember that when you go to school. Whenever you get there, when you get home, you're going to get it. Okay. So it's first grade. I come home with my little slip. They used to have the carbon copies. And if you got a paddling, that's what they call it. Teacher signed it, and you had to take your portion of that thing home and have your mom and dad sign it. But they saw that you got in trouble and you got three squats. So here I come home in the first grade with my little pad and slip. Mm -hmm. And let's just say I wasn't looking forward to dad getting home. So it was about time for dad to get home, and I had a favorite, cl favorite uh, climbing tree in the backyard, big old magnolia. <laughs> and I climbed up to the top of that magnolia when his truck was coming around the curb. <laughs> and there I was up at the top of the magnolia when Dad got home. And so, sure enough, the back door opened. Dad comes out the backyard and he says, what are you doing up there? I said, just climbing my favorite tree, you know. He says, you're going to have to come down here and deal with me. Okay. I, I didn't come down boldly. He came down very thin. And, of course, that went not the way I expected it to go. But, what I found in that is I could always come home in my Father's presence regardless because He loved me. God, because of the great love with which He loved us, has shown us mercy in Christ Jesus. And it says, let us therefore come home to the throne of grace. That therefore is there for a reason. is because we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. The Son of God, it says, Jesus, the Son of God, we should hold fast to our profession. And we have a high priest there who intercedes for us and who can sympathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in all points. And our entrance to the throne is not based upon how good of a week we had or a day we had, whether we did good in our sight, whether we did bad in our sight. It's based upon the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's what it says in the book of Hebrews. He made intercession for us. He made sacrifice, atonement for us once and for all. He entered in with his own blood. And he has interceded and made intercession for us, and he ever does so. He ever lived, the Bible says, to intercede for us. So whatever kind of week you had, it was all by the grace of God. And we have entrance to the throne room, 
by the grace of God that we may obtain mercy and grace to help in our time of need. So come boldly because you come out of Jesus. And so let us all stand and thank you for that this morning. Get our heart prepared to worship. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, forgive us at times, Lord, when we think, Lord, because of something we may perceive in ourselves to have happened. Uh, a good week of, Lord, we think we ought to be able to come in here and talk to the Lord. We don't even realize, Lord, we're facing that upon what we think we have done, Lord. And then, Lord, also, Lord, at times when we, we, we mess up and we stumble and we fall and we fail and we sin, we won't come, Lord, and that's also put it in on us, Lord. But we thank you, Lord, that our entrance, Lord, into the Holy of Holies, Lord, the true Holy of Holies, is solely based upon what Jesus has done for us in the world. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us, Lord, and sending him to die for our sins, Father. Help us to have hearts of worship, Lord, this morning. As we get ready, Lord, be with Dr. Dixon, Lord, as he brings your word. Bless him, Lord. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everyone say, tell uh, your neighbor hello. And let's get ready to worship. <laughs> <laughs> Lord willing, I think we're good to go. <laughs> huh? Yeah, I got the cameras going. We got I'm trying to switch views.
Yeah. 
Lord God, how can we not sing of your goodness? All that you have done. Everything you have made. Lord, everything that comes from your gracious hand. You're such an awesome, awesome God in so many ways. And Lord, our lives are dependent upon you. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for calling us together this morning. Lord, help us to be attentive to your word. Lord, this is what you would have to be shared with us this morning. Be with God as he brings your message and blessing. Lord God, fill us with your spirit. And Lord, help us to walk more closely with you and with each other. That we might bring you honor and glory and be a light for you in the dark world. Lord, thank you again for each other, for this time, for your word. We look to you even now. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Psalm says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. You know, when we look at Jesus, we look at Jesus, he is good. Yes, he is. He is. Yes, he is. And we really want to thank Scott Dixon for coming to preach to us. It's been a while. He says it was like January or February mm -hmm. since we've seen him. So he's a, he's a professor up at uh, Cedarville. And he has graciously uh, accepted to come to, to preach to us. So, Scott, come on. Thanks so much. Well, if I sit stand here, you guys are going to get a crick in your neck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'll just sit on the side. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make it a little firmer. I couldn't want that. It's good to be back. Yeah, I was just checking. Um, I looked back to see when I was here. And it was in January, like 5th and 12th, something like that. So it is good to be back. I'm glad to hear that you know, you're looking at somebody and could be things are moving forward, and that's good too. I, I, I try to pray for you on a regular basis. I did a little church down in uh, was it southwestern, no, I'm sorry, I was going to Ohio. Southeastern Indiana, or southwestern Ohio. Uh, good to be back. I, my GPS was having was freaking out when I was driving in on that is it state road or state something. And it say, "Welcome to Indiana. Welcome to Ohio. Welcome to Indiana. Welcome to Indiana." That was probably the problem. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we we love stories of, of adventure, right? Stories of, of quests. Uh, there are a lot of ancient stories, uh, more recent stories uh, that kind of have the same pattern. They they have the same plot. Where you have the strong hero, you know, the adventurer uh, who goes at the risk of everything to win the day. Uh, we love that, like Indiana Jones. There's been many, I think there's even a new one coming out here. I don't know how Harrison Ford stays up with that, but uh, yeah, you know, and I think the first one was the Ark of the Covenant, but, but then, the, you know, one of them was he was with his dad, was going to go get the Holy Grail. And all he had to do was perform miraculous feats. Uh, you know, only the penitent will pass. And, you know, we love that kind of thing. And it's, we have news stories like that. Every one of the multi-billion dollar movies seem to have that same theme. You know, Transformers to Batman. Uh, the Avengers, even our video games, The Legend of Zelda. Uh, my boys like that one, even in 30. Um, but it, it's the same, it, it touches the same nerve. These kinds of stories capture our hearts as well as our billions of dollars. Why? Why do we love stories of adventure and stories of quests? Well, I think it's because they, down deep inside, we all want to be the hero of the story. Is that how life really works? Do we get to be the heroes of our story? Well, there's a story in the Bible uh, that we teach our kids that really applies to us as adults as well. But it talks about this very thing. We're going to go back to the Old Testament. So take your Bibles and turn to the books of 2 Kings. Or have your phones. You can get that out. because I actually just put them on the slides today. So you're going to have to look at your own. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 5. I want to look at the story of a quest. The story of an adventure. It's about a man 
named Naaman. Okay, so 2 Kings chapter 5, and I'm going to start in verse 1. 2 Kings 5 verse 1. Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Now Naaman was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. And this little girl, she said to her mistress, Would that my lord, Naaman, were with the prophet who's in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, the king, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Well, go now, and I will send you a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman went, and taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel. And the letter read, when this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. <laughs> now when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends a word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Now when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him, talking about Naaman, let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to Naaman, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry, and he went away, saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me, and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash and then be clean? So Naaman turned and he went away in a rage. But his servants came near to him and they said, Father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will it not return? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So Naaman went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. Lord, um, this is a story uh, that we've heard. It is such a powerful testimony to how this world works, but most of all, to how you work in our lives. May we take this event from thousands of years ago and through it think about our lives today. And think about how you work in our lives. Naaman was a strong man. Naaman was willing to risk everything to win the day. He was on a quest called life. And from this man, Naaman, we learned three lessons from our own quests called life. And the first lesson is this. We all like to be the hero of our own story. We would all like to think that we have something to offer. We like to remain in control of our lives. We want to ride, ride our own story. 
Naaman, well, he's used to being a hero. Uh, and he's used to succeeding in his quest. Uh, think about it. Now, he, Syria, okay, he's from Syria, which was the mightiest nation in the world at that time. And he was the number one warrior. He was the major general. So he was the mightiest warrior of the mightiest nation. So he's got that going for him. So that you know, he's powerful. Two, uh, he was also tight with the most powerful person in the world, the king of Syria. So he could go up to him and ask him a favor. And third, Naaman had lots of riches that came with his position, lots of prestige with the kind of power that he had. But with all that, he was handed a death sentence. He was handed a roadblock. He got lepers. You know, disease is the great leveler of us all. And he didn't just have the potential of losing his life. Naaman would lose his power, his position. Gerald can't show weakness. <laughs> they can't have a hint of sickness. Secondly, he would lose his connections. What happens to lepers? You're ostracized. You're thrown outside the city. He couldn't talk to the king anymore. And third, he would lose his riches. What good would they do him now? That's the plot. I was the you know, when we think about our own lives, as we try to be heroes of our stories, as we try to be in charge of our plot, we've been doing that um, since Genesis 3. God created us to serve him and to serve his story, but Adam and Eve decided in Genesis 3 that they knew better, that they could do better writing their own stories than God, and that independence runs deep. We all wake up every morning pretty much thinking, hey, we're the center, the center of our story. We think we've got it figured out. We think we can handle life on our own. <laughs> Yet there have been consequences to that rebellion. Um, because down deep, we also know, along with that independence, we could lose our destiny. You know, there's going to come an end to the story. And we try to avoid it. We at least try to put it off. Remember Ponce de Leon and his searching for the fountain of youth. In fact, if you have a spare eight thousand dollars on you this morning, I know of a, 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 a website. Okay, you want to think this through? It's true. I know of a website where if you send them eight thousand dollars, they will send you plasma. Okay, that you can transfuse for your own plasma of somebody under the age of 25, which for me at 59 sounds pretty good. Right? <laughs> so they can give me that, and, and they, they tell me, if I take that plasma and substitute it for my own, I will start to feel like a saint. I, 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 it will cure me of my heart disease, if I have any, or my Alzheimer's. Now, the bad news is, the guy that sets up the website, the doctor, he lost his medical license, just so you know, so I don't know. But there, there, there are websites like that, right? Everybody knows we've been handed a death sentence and we try to put it off. There has been a robot flock to our quest, no matter how powerful we are. You know, some of the, some of the people most interested in these kinds of things, elongating our lives, are, are all the people doing the dot-com stuff out on the West Coast. And they all love the money. And they're investing it in trying to figure out how to make us live longer. And it, it just, because they know. I don't care how rich you are, you're still going to die. We all have roadblocks, right? We have a, a disease. We also have sometimes unhealthy relationships. Maybe we have a loss of work or maybe unsatisfying work. Maybe there's an addiction. Maybe it's some family story. There are roadblocks in our quest of life, just like me. Yet in the midst of the roadblocks, the good news is God sends a missionary. See, God sent a missionary in the most unlikely costume, in the most unlikely shape and size to name. Remember down to verse 2. It's fascinating. Now the Syrian on one of the rings. This little girl became the maid or the, the servant of, of Naaman's wife. 
And, and, and she was a missionary. You know, many of, of you are here this morning because God sent a missionary to you. And they see their faces. Wonder what they were thinking when they um, someone God sent to you to help you with that boat. Maybe God is calling you to be a missionary like that little girl or somebody else in life. Maybe at your workplace, and maybe in your family, neighborhood, school. This unlikeliest of all missionaries sent Naaman on that quest. And he took his riches with him. He, he took his silver, he took his 6,000 shekels of gold because Naaman thought he could buy his way in. He also took his connections. He got a letter from the king, the most powerful person in the most powerful nation in the world. He not only thought he could buy his way in, Naaman thought he could smooth his way in. And he also took his reputation, riding in his big chariot with his legions of people behind him. He thought he could find his way in. Naaman came to Israel thinking he had something to offer God. And that's not so unusual. That's how life works often. That's how his world worked for Naaman. It was quid pro quo. You do something for me and I'll do something for you. That's why the king of Israel was freaking out. He, did, he knew he couldn't do what the king of Syria asked him to do. That's how their religions were. They thought the greater the sacrifice to their God, the greater the, uh, what the God would owe them. See, we often come to God in that mindset, thinking we have something to offer him. God, I need this, so would you fix me? Tell me what to do. Just tell me what to change. I'll change it. Just tell me how much to give, and I'll give it. But when we do that, when we negotiate with God, thinking we could offer him something, let me ask you a question. Who is the hero of the story? Who is the center of the story? It's still us. Naaman thought he could negotiate with this God of Israel while still remaining the hero of the story. But God had other plans. Lesson number one from Naaman. We all want to be the hero. Lesson number two. God. When Naaman arrived at Elisha's door, with all his riches and all his connections and all his power, he thought with God he negotiated. But what he found out is that God wanted to do more than Naaman was willing to do. Naaman came to pay this God of Israel a visit, and Elisha didn't even come to the door. He just sent a message. Naaman, go wash in the Jordan. Your own granddaughter. Sometimes she gets so tired and upset, she laughs and cries at the same time. You know what I mean? <laughs> they was going to hissy, but he's laughing and crying at the same time. He he said, if, if, if the irony of this story, if Elijah had said, I want gold and silver, they would have said, done. Well, yeah, yeah. If Elijah had said, I want a favor from the king of Syria, they would have said, done. If Elisha had said, give me the head of my greatest enemy, Naaman, Naaman would have said, done. Bring me the wicked witch of the West broom. Right? You know, he could do it. He just. And all Elisha wanted Naaman to do was take a bath. <laughs> Did you ever think when you were a kid listening to that story how crazy it is? He just wanted to take a bath. Naaman's entourage, his service had to talk him down. What's the big deal about seven voluntary dumps in the Jordan River? Well, let me ask you something. What's it mean for a man like me, a warrior, friend of the king, big time? What's it mean for him to stand out? He'd have to step out of his chariot, probably the second best ride in all of the world, in all of Syria, behind the king, and all the best judges. 
done spite from out of heaven. That's the thing in, in her, right? His place of authority, right? And that day, I mean, he rode the jury. That, that was his tank. He had the place of honor. He had to step out of there. Number two, he would have to take off his clothes. Think about generals, right? The five-star generals and all this stuff. The, the, the stuff they wear, that, that, that's to engender respect and awe. So when they say jump, you say how high. He had to take that off. Walk out in that water all by himself. There wouldn't be any connection back then. He'd be all alone. What was Elisha asking? What was God asking? He was asking Elijah, Naaman to give up control of everything. Stripped of everything. See, as long as Naaman kept his clothes on, as long as he sat in the chariot, he remained the focus. But once he stepped out, took off his clothes, he gave up everything. So here's a question that it, it, I struggle with sometimes. Was Naaman upset because the bar was too high, or the bar was too low? You know, my man of means, my prayer of courage, I have friends in all the right places. A child could have done that. He's got to. He has to be. He's not fooling you. He doesn't want to step over that bar because it's too low. He doesn't want to do it because it's too high. See, God didn't want him. God didn't want his connections. God didn't want his power and his strength. God just wanted his life. And then he wasn't willing to give it to him. If his salvation came by his exploits, by his stuff, who would have the upper hand in his relationship with God? Who would have been in control? But if we give up everything, lives, then we owe God. If Naaman could have won his way into God's good graces, who would get to call the shots? One of my favorite preachers, Tim Keller, calls that threatening grace. See, God's grace is pretty threatening. Because it says, he owes us nothing. This story is such a clever illustration of, of how we have to approach life and how we need to approach God. Um, we also, like Naaman, face mortality, don't we? Yet none of the things that we cling to that we think make us matter help us face God. For all of us, there's going to come a time where we stand before him alone, Last year, uh, I, I went to a funeral of a 52-year-old man, uh, an acquaintance of mine. Uh, he had, had gotten cancer and died young, and, and he was a teacher at my kid's high school and a football coach for one of my sons who played football. And, and, and his name is Dave. He's a very godly man, a Christian man. He went to Cedarville as an undergrad. And he had a great impact on many of the students at the high school, the football players. And he had a beautiful legacy. And so I remember it was a, the line, it was at our church, our, our, our home church back in Ohio. And the line to get in, you know, just to see the family in the, in the auditorium was just hours long. And, uh, and, and on, on his casket, you know, was the, the, the pictures, the family pictures, also the football helmet from the high school, and then his uh, Cleveland Browns jersey, the other Browns. And uh, it just reminded me that at death, when we're in that casket, everything else is gone. Maybe on top of the casket, everything else is gone. When we die, uh, everything is stripped away. Even our good lives, gone. We don't have our loved ones. We don't have our work accomplishments. We don't have our stuff. All that gets left behind. We stand before God. So it's of the utmost 
most urgency that we have a clear understanding that we can't approach God on our own terms. We will never be sure of our soul. We have to let go of those things that we think we have to offer God. Just like me. our riches, it, it may be power or control or the right connections. For us in a church service on a Sunday morning, it may very well be a mere flower. God owes me because I can do more than a flower. See, if, if you want to meet God, if you want a counter, an encounter with the most powerful being in the universe, he's not asking for your moral life. He's not asking you to be good. He's not asking for your riches or your connections or your power. He's just asking for control of your life. Which brings us to lesson number three. See, we all want to be the hero of our story. God will call our bluff on that plan. Third, then, we come face to face. As we think about Naaman, who is the hero? Who is the person in charge? Is it the king of Syria? No. <laughs> is it Naaman? No, of course not Naaman. Is it Elisha? Is it little girl? You know, actually, Naaman tells us who the hero of the story is. I, I didn't finish. Look back at verse 15 of 2 Kings 5. After he was made then, verse 15, Naaman returned to the man of God, to Elisha. Naaman and all his company. And he came and he stood before Elisha and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So accept now a present from your servant. Now, we need to understand context of, of that statement. The world that Naaman lived in, when he said, I know there is no God except the God of Israel. See, in, in Naaman's day, your God was in direct connection with the power of your nation. Okay? I mean, the better your God, the better your nation. The better your nation, the better your God. And now, this guy from Syria, who's fought many battles under the name of the Syrian gods, is saying it's the God of Israel who's the God of all. The only power is found not in Syria, it's found in Israel. Everything I've lived for my life, Naaman said, everything I've fought for pales in comparison. Naaman's whole identity had been changed. It wasn't just cleansing from leprosy, he was being cleansed from being the hero of we all understood it's God who's the hero. Don't miss the exclusive declaration that he makes. No God except in Israel. That would have been offensive to all the people in Syria. But with the help of his servants, he understood that his salvation and his healing depended on doing it God's way, not his way. Yahweh was the hero, not me. And that's no different in our race. In our day. Our culture does not like the claim there is only one God and he's found in this book. There's only one way and it's found in this book. They don't like that. In our culture, exclusivity like that smacks of bigotry, of being unloving, of being prideful. But yet, who was the loving one in Haman? Who were the ones that served him? Little slave girl, his servants, Elisha.
Elisha's bold instruction? They were the ones with the courage. They were the ones with the love. And that's what it takes for our day. To stand and help people see where the hero of their story rests. And this book takes courage. This is true love. The God of Israel is the hero of the story. And there's so much irony, isn't there? Again, in this story, that, that all the no name people play such key roles when all the big shots can't handle it. The strong were the king of Syria. He could only send a letter. The king of Israel could only freak out. Naaman himself couldn't do a thing. But it was that little slave girl. It was the entourage of Naaman. It was the weak. It's the God. Remember the stories that were drawn through all the quests, all the adventures from the past to the present? It's the strong that has the courage, that has the ability to see the quest through. One of the, the scholars of those kinds of myths is a guy named J.R. Tolkien. You may have heard of him. If you ever heard of him, you've heard of his books, The Lord of the Rings. J.R. Tolkien wrote a story unlike the usual. The hero was not the strong or the mighty. The hero was found in a weak poverty. A halfling who sacrificed something very precious Mighty becomes weak. The sacrifice is Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. Christ humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death. Have you encountered the God of Israel, the God of the Bible? Not a God you can negotiate with, not a God you can placate with your good works or even your own sacrifice. God of the Bible, who demands nothing from us but our lives. See, that's the God who is the hero of all of us. The one who would become weak and would give his life for us. Edward Caluso writes these words The heavens frighten us, they are too calm. In all the universe, we have no place. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is the ball? Lord Jesus, by thy scars, we know thy pain. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a god has wounds. Lord, in a way, it's, it's reassuring that we have nothing to offer. Because as much as we like to be the hero, we all know down deep we can't do it. We've tried. We've tried. And it always comes, it always comes up empty. Nothing we can do can ever make up. what we don't have. Just like Naaman, we do want to be in charge. But just like Naaman, we just ask for our lives. To, to give up our quest and to cling to your son. He's made the sacrifice. He's given up the riches and the position 